I wanted to give you a little bit of something about the arc of a book. And so what I've done here is uh, you have the opening poem of the new book and you have the closing poem of the new book. And when you make a book, these are, of course, as we all know, you think really hard about what's the beginning and what's the end. Even though we all know nobody reads books of poems from the first page to last page. I certainly don't until I already love it. If I've opened it and I adore it, then I will read it for page one to the end. And I will also often read them backwards, just because I'm strange that way. Um, but still, you order a book very much along the same principles that you order a poem. You all know the, the scientific concept of fractals, where you know it's the same thing repeated at different layers of scales, and coastlines are fractals, and all, all sorts of things are fractals. Poems and books are made the same way, in that you want variation, and you want arc, and you want the beginning to know that the end is there, and you really want the end to know that the beginning is there and that there has been a journey between them. So the opening poem, French Horn. For a few days only, the plum tree outside the window shoulders perfection. No matter the plums will be small, eaten only by squirrels and jays. I feast on the one thing, they on another, the shoaling bees on a third. What in this unpleated world isn't someone's seduction? The boy playing his intricate horn in Mahler's fifth, in the gaps between playing, turns it and turns it, dismantles a section, shakes from it the condensation of human passage. He is perhaps 20. Later he takes his four bows, his face deepening red, while a girl holds a viola's spruce wood and maple in one half-opened hand and looks at him hard. Let others clap. These two, their ears still ringing, hear nothing. Not the shouts of bravo, bravo. Not the tympanic clamor inside their bodies. As the plums blossoms, do not hear the bee, nor taste themselves turned into storable honey by that sumptuous disturbance. Now, I don't know what my books are going to be about when I am writing the poems. I am writing, most of my books are about five or six years between each other. So the poems in any given book are simply reflections. What have I been feeling? What have I been struggling with? What have my disasters been in that period of years? What have my questions been? What has happened to my life? What has happened to the life of the world? Only when I go to put the book in order do I actually, for that moment, and then I try to forget it again as quickly as possible, do I have any awareness of what are the themes in this book? Because you have to. To put them in an order, you have to see what's similar, what's different. So the great theme of Come Thief is probably time. Um, you know, it's, it's a book which uh, pretty much has the central arc of going from uh, early 50s to almost 60 in it. And so it has late love in it. I fell in love when I was 49 and a half, so it has poems which reflect that experience of what is it to fall in love when you're, when you're older and to have that experience again. It has poems that reflect the fact that the country has been at war the entire time that it was written and is still at war. I was especially distressed by Abu Ghraib and what was done there. That is a note that sounds in various places through the book. Um, it expands out into many places in the world. This is the phase in my life where, for some reason, I get put on what I've come to think of as air pegasus a lot. I mean, poetry has taken me to China, to Japan, to Poland, to Lithuania, to, to England, uh, to Turkey, to Syria. Um, to Jordan, and 
that's in this book too. So I wanted at the beginning to introduce not only love, not only time, plum trees, you know, the petals fall immediately. It's an old Japanese thing, you know, plum trees and cherry trees are immediate signals of, of transience, everything. It's only a few days. You don't have to know Japanese poetry, you know, it says so right there in the first line, for a few days only. So you already know this is a book about time vanishing from under your feet. And whatever perfection and whatever fullness it's going to give you will will vanish, and the plums are going to be sour, and they're going to be stolen by squirrels and jays. So lots of the themes are actually right here in this, including sumptuous disturbance. And this is probably a lifelong struggle for me to find disturbance sumptuous, rather than make me want to jump off a bridge. Um, you know, so... So imagine you have traveled through, at this point, you've taken the Silk Road, you've, you've dropped in at Auschwitz for a poem, um, you, you, you have, uh, you know, you, you've sort of been through late love, you've been through all of these things which are in the book, and then you have to figure out how are you going to close the book that opened with this pastoral, cultural, uh, the condensation of human passage. I loved it. The poem ran in the New Yorker, and you always get lots of notes and emails when a poem runs in the New Yorker. And it turns out an enormous number of people I know have some relationship to the French horn. I had no idea. And so my favorite email was the woman who said, Jane, you do know it was spit, right? <laughs> this condensation of human passage. And I said, yeah, yeah, I know it was spit. <laughs> you know, they, in the middle of playing, every time there's a break, they're like dumping the instrument. <laughs> um, so anyhow, what did the book, and you know, the French horn was not always the first poem. Supple Deer was not always the last poem. There were You revise your book order as much as you revise anything else. But I decided to end with permeability. So, and we're back in the garden. Um, the Supple Deer. The quiet opening between fence strands, perhaps 18 inches. Antlers to hind hooves, four feet off the ground, the deer poured through. No tuft of the coarse white belly hair left behind. I don't know how a stag turns into a stream, an arc of water. I have never felt such accurate envy. Not of the deer, to be that porous, to have such largeness pass through me. So, it is kind of a fulfillment and a restatement of the willingness to let the perfection of the plum tree vanish. I mean, believe me, when the deer actually do get into my garden and they do eat all the vegetables and they eat the rose bushes down to stubs, you wouldn't, I mean, it's thorns. How do they do this? But they love rose bushes. You know, I'm, I, I put the fence up for a reason, but, Deer are amazing. And you know, it was quite literal. I, I, people often think, how did you find that image? Well, I saw the deer <laughs> jump through the, you know, and it was four feet off the ground, and the gap was this big, and how did he get his antlers through? And he just, I mean, you know, it just happened and completely undid me. And then, you know, again, if there's a surprise here, the way in the poem, the present, the surprise is the shift of the meaning of the word. The surprise here is that I don't want to be the deer. You know, that's the obvious charismatic megafauna, as, as they like to say. Um, no, I'm saying let me be the fence. Let me be the thing which is supposed to be setting a limit and is absolutely, it can't, can't keep anything in can't keep anything out. And this is the last thing I will say before we go to question and answers, that you know, for me, again, just to, to leave the question of transitions in a narrow sense and talk about the life of poetry in a larger sense, I think this is why we write poems and why we love poems, is because the barricade of self 
which is so useful to us and so necessary in so many ways. But it is also a prison if you don't feel your connection to everybody else and to everything else. And I think poems work by having us feel that everything described in a poem, everything alluded to a poem, while you are reading that poem, it is inside your skin. It is you. You can't understand the image of a log or a moon or ashes or a deer or Mahler except by becoming that in some part of yourself for that instant. And so when we read poems, when we write poems, when we love poems, what we are doing is becoming absolutely permeable to everything and every one, and to our own lives. And if we are brave enough to show those poems to other people, to you and your response to those things.